information to someone. So maybe I can, with this uh, keyword, introduce Jennifer Whitson, who is in the audience as well, and worked on surveillance and games a lot. Um, you're located at uh, Concordia University. Um, what, what is your feel about this um, horrifying <laughs> scenario of security that uh, surveillance that, that comes up with, with games and gaming? I think I'm a joyful cynic <laughs> that there's a lot of things that are problematic, but there's also a lot of hope. And, you know, I spent years researching game analytics in the game industry and how it changed the creative work of game makers because instead of you know following their vision for sort of creating spaces of joy or play or whatever um, they were trying to follow and cater to the masses the vision of economic success mm. by tailoring their game on the fly according to you know who plays it how they play it who the big spenders are how do we design to uh, encourage these big spenders and how do we figure out the psychological profiles of people who aren't big spenders yet but we can maybe nudge them into being big spenders um, and so in the mainstream game industry it, it has become in some sense sort of game design by numbers you know following this sort of surveillance trajectory about learning more and more about your players um, and, and so that's kind of depressing but then on the other side there has been an explosion in the sort of tools and the democratization of game making and making spaces of play, uh, you know, through Unity and Game Maker um, that not only allows super talented artists and creators like yourself but to make games, but even children and, and classrooms and things like that. And the interesting thing about this is that this democratization of game making tools has flooded the app market um, and so it makes it so much more difficult to make money by making games um, and so these people that are surveilling and sort of doing game design by numbers this sort of whole informatic infrastructure is also problematized and crumbling because so many people are making games and releasing them for free and doing all sorts of crazy novel stuff um, and so there's hope there, right? That game making and game playing is an endeavor that we can take part in and that isn't only sort of driven by economic surveillance mm -hmm. imperatives. Um, so that's how I sort of play into it, yeah. Right, so, so two of you who are sitting there in the front row are also into this crazy innovative stuff, Elias and Anna, who work together with Ned. What, what is your um, aim or what is your target group or what is your wish with, with the development of this game? To provoke a kind of political action maybe, I know it sounds very optimistic, but um, this uh, demo, it's not a game, uh, gives some hints um, in some new um, forms, what uh, Ned explained before, of uh, capitalistic uh, reproduction and reconstitution. Mm. Um, it is a simulation, and here I want to make a parenthesis on the choose of the media, the 3D environment. Uh, we chose this uh, because uh, we thought it was very important to simulate uh, what is called uh, logistical city, the infrastructures and the installations that um, corresponds uh, uh, directly to the specific uh, area of Piraeus and maybe in the development of the game the other uh, infrastructures of the logistical uh, world of PCT, Costco, uh, in, uh, in Greece. So it was important to, um, to show the impression to the players and also um, having the possibility to, to choose, uh, in the beginning at least, to which players you are addressed um, and to show um, the whole picture. Um, Costco installations in uh, Piraeus and in general the infrastructure uh, is not an area that everybody is allowed to enter. Uh, you have to be uh, authorized to be part uh, even as um, a passenger. Uh, so most of the people in Greece at least uh, when we started this research, uh, 
in our surprise, we realized that most of Athenians, they didn't uh, know anything about, uh, although it's situated 15 kilometers from uh, the center of the town. So the idea of the digital aesthetics we used is first to recreate, to simulate what, not in perfection, of course, but uh, in a degree, what is about, what is the feeling of being uh, into, uh, as a worker, or as a syndicalist uh, into a logistical city and the other infrastructures. And the second thing that uh, we tried in this demo is to give these hints that Ned said before about the relation between uh, algorithm and uh, new labor. How algorithmic uh, uh, processes transform uh, the traditional uh, ways of perception of labor in real. And what the resistance could be, what the political resistance could be uh, at this new situation. Uh, <clears throat> by chance, it happens that these days Greece changed government. Mm. Um, it was a radical uh, change. And uh, the first uh, question put by uh, journalists, foreigners and Greek journalists, was about Costco. What are you going to do with Costco? It seems that everyone learned uh, out of a sudden that Costco exists and Costco had the biggest deal with the Greek state uh, during this period of austerity measures. And uh, I think that uh, the idea of um, having a simulation of working conditions, of algorithmic um, uh, interchanges and uh, interwind uh, situations uh, regarding labor and uh, pass the information firstly to the people concerned uh, with uh, Costco and uh, the deal with the Greek state and in a second uh, degree with the rest of the citizens, um, it could be a kind of political challenge. Okay. I would like to ask to be as, or Anna, if you want to add something, please do. <laughs> okay, uh, very, very uh, sh uh, shortly to say that uh, our intent was exactly to show the space of PCT in conjunction with the space around it. Uh, you have um, a, land a landscape which is doesn't fit to this futuristic city which is built down in Piraeus. And uh, also, yes, as Celia said, is a protected area, highly protected area. And uh, nobody can get it unless really is authorized and the workers uh, can go only to a certain, uh, follow a certain route in there. You cannot travel or wander around. That was important to us to show. And again, uh, things are changing so rapidly in Piraeus uh, when we finished the uh, uh, research back in uh, uh, April. Uh, there was not even union at Costco, but then things changed and we have a union now forming a union and the new government is supporting it. So there are changes, rapid changes there and definitely that will affect the uh, uh, labor conditions which were really uh, crude in this particular part of the piers. Mm -hmm. uh, something that it, we mentioned in the game, uh, that uh, the workers had t two hours, actually they were receiving an SMS, and uh, they had two hours to report to their shift. Mm -hmm. So uh, this kind of th information we try to put into this game and that's the reason that we chose actually in this particular aesthetics to simulate, not exactly, but to give this uh, sense of spaces and how both spaces, the landscape, the Greek landscape and the city um, react or relate one to the other. Mm. So it seems that um, providing information is something that you and you are, you are oh, yeah. all we, we, uh, interested in. Tobias, could you um, finish with this round and then we open it to the okay. um, audience, please? Hi, um, thanks. It was really interesting to hear both about both those games. I don't know a huge amount about games design, but I have a project here about um, exploitative labor that might 
arise through gamification and things like that. Thank you for Civilization VI. I'm a huge fan of the Civ series. I, I'm, I, have a, I have questions, I also have comments. A question for you guys is about why you went with the kind of retro aesthetic for that. For something that's actually super modern and super kind of invisible, you've chosen a kind of deliberately 80s, low resolution, Atari style aesthetic. I was wondering what the decision behind that was. First of all, <clears throat> okay, this modification of the game is done by most of the graphic by myself. Okay, Christian, it's more about the text and uh, the content. So it's the first obvious reason. It's like it's much more easy to <laughs> do something with a lo-fi aesthetic than to spend like 1,000 hours doing something complex. Um, another problem graphically is that you know it's like really abstract world, and um, you know to to visualize. Uh, Cyberspace, it's, it's something really hard. And also to visualize the, the viruses, to visualize the different kind of algorithms, it's really complex. So we choose to, to be in a really simple 8-bit version of the world in order to deal with the, the, this abstraction. Cool. Um, and then the second question is, uh, as I understood from what you're saying, your your games, uh, your civilization games are both part critique and sort of a, a sort of tongue-in-cheek prediction of perhaps what they'll do next. Do you have a quick reflection on the latest civilization, which seems humans conquering other planets? The, 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 who the going to prime planet? Who the, the new civilization? I believe has uh, humans going out into space and conquering other planets, and as as making critical games about that way of seeing the world. I was wondering if you had any reflection on that. Kind of actually, the first ideas for, for for this civilization six, like it, it was like influenced by algorithms on the stock exchange, flash crash, and all the stuff, and then we somehow like started also to, like to think about like okay, but this is like really in a way quite magic circle of stock exchange so like you, you really need to enter the space of stock exchange and then to perform uh, to to let the softwares and the algorithms to play by themselves and buy and, and and sell if you know about like the high frequency trading more or less and then like we switched okay but this is really it's important it, it influences our lives like uh, Automated stock exchange in London uh, on the level of I think 60 percentage and, and, and uh, Dow Jones around 70 percentage is automated. But then we say like, but okay, but there is really something really even more like the, um, influencing, which is surveillance, which is like slowly starting like physically damaging of the infrastructure with the Stuxnet, with all the things that that viruses and malwares and uh, stuff are being. Uh, are doing so then we a bit move to, 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 to do basically to cyber warfare and that's the thing and uh, like going to space I don't know maybe some kind of cyborgs will go to space who knows it's just um, I, I have a great knowledge of cinema really rather than games but it's interesting the the way that disaster cinema responds to uh, crisis on earth and the, something like interstellar which was particularly a thing of oh we can't deal with climate change so we'll just go somewhere else instead it seems that civilization may well fall into that bracket of, oh, we'll just go to another planet because this one's too destroyed. Thank you um, for that answer. I then have some stuff for the other guys. So um, thanks again for that. I was, I was really um, particularly interested. I was trying to mentally compare it to the, the Maersk uh, simulation game. Maersk have their sort of container ship simulation game where you take charge of their network and run around the world trading invisible objects through this kind of mass network. And it was interesting to see how that's done from the, the God's eye view where you're at the control center and yours is from the, the, the floor of those harbors that that game probably affects. You could almost see them as, as parallel game worlds that could live together. Um, and I also liked the, you, you were, the references to code space, the fact that really those ports are just embodied software, really. You know, the people in it are just programs performing a function that's seen by those control centers. Um, and it's interesting that both games are about infrastructure. So I wanted to ask if there's something about infrastructure, and we're uh, certainly in the design and art circles I move in, we're having a lot more conversations about infrastructure. Um, is there something about infrastructure that lends itself to games as a medium, as opposed to making a documentary or a fiction or a comic book or anything else that could be used to critique these worlds? 
Who wants to answer this question? Is infrastructure that something that can be yeah, no, displayed absolutely. or talked about in a no, game? No, uh, in, entirely appropriate and important question because um, the types of um, uh, um, training games, right, and videos that you described there by the key logistical companies uh, were for initially, you know, a really key point of reference um, in thinking even, you know, the possibility of game design as it relates to an analysis of global logistics industries. Um, and indeed, we also thought about how might we develop something that can um, fund our pension kind of requirements uh, once our body is worn out, you know, to sell out to the kind of logistics gaming industry. Um, you know, that's the kind of B version that we don't usually talk about. <laughs> it's all um, uh, but, you know, more importantly, right, you know, the question of infrastructural design um, is a key one to put on the table for for all of us with this kind of concern. Why? Of course, because you know, precisely we can't enter these infrastructural spaces that Ilias was referring to, um, or these proprietary kind of worlds. Uh, or you know, the kind of data that we generate is entirely expropriated and locked up again and sold back to us. Um, or you know, you've got the political geography of data centers, right? Um, another kind of key infrastructural device that um, has a lot of uh, impact on you know, uh, high frequency trading, um, of course and low latency, you know, the, the economy of low latency. Uh, so, you know, the kind of question again is, you know, uh, how do we go about infrastructural design? And it's very interesting hearing about the way in which, you know, one sort of hilarious uh, seeming intervention here is the overabundance of game um, design and access to that uh, and the extent to which that may impact upon the kind of political economy of the game industry, right? Um, uh, also, actually, is an important political resource for us to have our own infrastructures. And I would certainly be including um, uh, the games that we produce as part of our, our own infrastructures as a resource that we draw on for the purpose of whatever it may be, um, politics, um, aesthetics, um, uh, pleasure, uh, you, you know, whatever you want to kind of attach to that. But the point is that we own it, right? Um, and that it can't be kind of taken. Uh, and, and this is um, uh, the moment kind of invention, of invention, I think, and, and possibility. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, the infrastructure is a key term. May I open uh, questions from the, from the audience? Do you want to comment on anything like the keywords that Matt just dropped, politics, aesthetics, uh, pleasure, or any other issue to each of them? Yes, I have a question there. How shall we deal with the microphone? Sonia, can you? Um, th thank you for the interesting input. Uh, I was wondering, what is your stand on the gamification of uh, project level, say, uh, having rewards and celebrating small wins and yeah. stuff like that you see a lot in software development? I'm curious what you think of gamification. I mean, I, I, I just find myself being hugely pessimistic about it, really. Um, the way I in which... you as the optimist and now you're pessimistic. Yeah, why not? Have it both ways. Um, uh, but gamification just seems to be this um, kind of production of an infantile subject um, who is submissive, right? Um, at least the way in which I see, for example, the whole logistics apparatus moving into the world of the university and knowledge production. You know, what a disaster to have the kind of parameters and formatting of interoperability, of standardization, uh, of a kind of protocological control uh, occurring within spaces of invention and creativity, right? Whether that's your precarious kind of cultural uh, co working space. Um, uh, you know, but certainly it's moving into the university, which was one of the key reasons to move on to the logistics topic in the first place, was to see this as um, a kind of tsunami, if you like, that was spreading across social life. And if you want to know about your enemy, you kind of get on board fast, and then you learn how to make the intervention, let's hope. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm not a big fan of gamification, but I don't know, what, what's the call there? One could also see it as a form of ideology, I think, and not in the sense of how Marx used the term, but in the sense of how Althusser or Son Rethel used uh -huh. it, that it is not necessarily something which is um, set up upon us to suppress us only or to, to control us, but uh, that is necessary, that is economically necessary and at the same time false consciousness. So it is, suggests something that is not true, that means not in relation to our full uh, existence that we could live. So it has this double, dub, double uh, coining of being false and necessary, and that is why it's so difficult to escape it, actually. 
So that would be one, uh, one take on w what gamification actually is. And I think Bernhard Stiegler wants to point in a similar uh, direction with his uh, recent notion of that he says we live in a, a society of hyper control. And he says is that to um, suggest that we are not only in a control society, as um, Deleuze might have uh, called it, and we are not only in a um, surveillance society, as uh, Foucault would have put it, but he wants to have this hyper control society as a new notion where there's a new form of control that is necessarily uh, introduced by the system to keep the system running. Yeah, the quantified self would be a perfect example of that. Right. You know, not, not just the quantified con self, but the quantified self movement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the willing encounter and embrace of becoming quantified, right? Mm. Because you get a better insurance premium if you participate in the gamification, right? Totally frightening, disgusting practice, okay. right? But these are these like dreams <laughs> and nightmares in the same time of, of cybernetics, like because you have this like non-stop feedback loop, like with this reward system and like yeah. achievements. Yeah, you know, become healthy, but we're going to fuck you over as soon as you don't meet your, meet, meet, meet your KPI. KPIs. KPI. Sonia, please. Um, I would like to, uh, thanks guys for uh, fascinating <laughs> examples. But I would like to go back to the question of infrastructure and um, I mean, and based on that, I have a question to all the three of you or concerning the two projects. Um, what you did is you presented some kind of statements, um, very political statements, ideological statements, by using the, um, the interface, the games infrastructure. So to put it shortly, you use the, the power of the procedurality of the computer medium. And now my question is, since both of you used, um, you guys operated with an infrastructure, a structure, an interface, on different levels of the structure that is already there using the uh, some modding uh, civilization. Um, you, Ned, from, from, from what I understood, uh, your project was designed uh, from scratch, but also using some kind of game development tools, right, which allowed you for a certain structure um, that could be built. Um, so um, my question to, to, to all of you would be um, the first one, is there any reason uh, for which you decided to work with uh, those certain structures? So in, in your terms, guys, the, the, to mod instead of to build it from scratch, other than practical issues. And uh, the other one, um, yeah, you, you also chose a totally different perspective. So you made your comment, you made your statement using the um, um, is a metric uh, perspective as opposed to the, the 3D um, first person probably uh, perspective. So these are my two questions on the infrastructure, structure interface or whatever you call it. Like, as I, I mentioned already that um, we did like, our first game was that we really did from the scratch, like even building the engine of the game. I think it was in Delphi, that it was really like hardcore programming in the beginning of 2000. But to choose of civilization was really intentional. And in the beginning, it was not like that we used civilization as a tool to express something. But we were, in a way, kind of um, having case study with the civilization as a model of thinking, as a model of civilization. Because it's quite competitive context. And um, with some kind of elements of culture inside and some other elements, but it's really like super competitive. And it's, it, it was interesting like how you train, especially youngsters and teenagers, to certain kind of thinking. And especially in that time, I think still not now. I mean, you don't have, I mean, in the, in the so-called old media, you have some kind of censorship in a way. If certain things you can't say, you can't, I mean, there is some kind of politically correct language, whether we like it or not, but it's still certain kind of level that you just can't throw it. But in the games, and especially like for the youngsters, teenagers in, in, in like nine, 10 years old, it was really like uh, certain games, like real-time strategy games were really, really militaristic. It was like deeply racistic, like, and then it was really that you need, you need to annihilate your opponent. But uh, with these words quite often, and the command language was quite embedded, and it was quite inherent in these games. And uh, that was something for us that was really like shocking. And then we started to talk like, what to do with this? And that was the reason why we chose civilization. I think like, 
we play with this irony, like in the first game, in the second game a bit, but this third game is a bit like that, that, that it was it was a bit irony, but not so much actually. Now now I I think that we are not that we are somewhere in the middle. So it, regarding the artistic concept, it, I think it's quite failed, like like as an art, because you, in art you need to be like rather ironic, you need to stand to play this irony, like completely full, or you need to be some kind of open activist and to be with open heart and everything so people can see you honest. In this context, we're something in between because we don't actually, like, uh, we didn't choose this strategy and we just, we, we, don't, we didn't want it in that way. So it's something in between, I think. And then the second part of Sonia's question is the perspective that you use, is this the perspective of empowerment? I think of the um, Laden wanted to add something. So is, oh, sorry. Yeah. Nothing, just. You know, it started to be some kind of diary that, like, every three or four years, we are using the same. Uh, but it's structure. a trilogy, actually. We wanted to do trilogy in the beginning, as like Lord of the Rings and the Matrix. It was the idea from the beginning, but so, because it's our hobby, but because we are just because that's why we're doing it each five years, mm. <laughs> somewhere, and this is the end of the trilogy. So it's the end. We like promise. <laughs> yeah. We'll not torture you anymore. Let's do. Yeah, uh, Elias and Anna are a much better place to address the question of, um, you know, um, 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 development and, and aesthetic decisions there. Um, but as far as it relates to the topic of infrastructure, um, uh, it's about also the process of collective research over a period of a year um, through a range of different media of expression to kind of make visible and draw attention to the politics of infrastructural geographies and the kind of economies they spawn that aren't necessarily at all um, within the kind of closed world of um, uh, um, formal infrastructural economies. In other words, you know, the game makes a point of drawing attention to informal economies um, that are kind of secondary and precipitate um, out as a result of um, the presence of these imperial infrastructures um, that can't be kind of foreseen within the logic of the protocological borders, if you like, of that infrastructural system. Uh, within that space, you have the production of new subjectivities, new forms of violence um, uh, and dispossession when it comes to populations uh, engaged in those um, economies and the spaces within which those economies um, exist. Um, and, you know, it's a way of drawing attention to these kind of... Um, uh, ethnic kind of conflicts as well, right? Um, uh, between Roma populations, um, between Golden Dawn right-wing fascists. Um, yeah. And so it becomes a way of, yeah, expressing that kind of narrative, right, in, uh, that enables different forms of dissemination than your newspaper op-ed might. I think we've got um, time for one more question from, from the audience because I promised Daphne to close the session in time. And here it is. Thanks. Um, it's all very fascinating. Um, I'm not super expert on gaming, but um, I'm curious a bit about, um, I hear a lot of talk about the sort of, like the more intellectual ideas that go into the process of creating these games and how they kind of are used to um, uh, sort of inform new perspectives on sort of ideological standpoints or on game processes in general. But I'm curious about um, the actual uh, sort of rep repetition and action in games and how that kind of, how that informs like action in real worlds or in, um, or in sort of, uh, um, in outside of the gaming world, like how these kind of repetition like informs how people um, interact with the world. So say for games that are like promote violence and these kind of things, um, or games about like, uh, you know, bombing Gaza and these things that I hear about that are absolutely horrific and that just the sort of ideas about like linking pleasure and entertainment to action and how um, if this is something that goes into how you create and produce games and how you um, relate that to these games in particular. Do you have some, some concrete games in, in mind? 
Oh, or... I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious about like how you guys think about it in terms of producing your own games and um, like how you how you uh, think about sort of the role of the user and sort of repetition and action and if that's something that goes into um, how you think about your pro productions. Always, well, as you also like, you have specific kind of team as you know, as all other aspects of like activity or, or let's say kind of doing something. Like you have some kind of topic that is in, of interest for you, and then you start research. But like in this context, game is a medium that have specific like uh, rules and tasks, and then you comply or you create your own. I, maybe you can also say. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like very specifically, maybe for your game, um, it's like how the user is sort of put into the role of like the NSA, and how pleasure is starts to be linked with mm -hmm. actively sort of like dominating and controlling these kind of whistleblowers or these sort of, you know, and and how does that? How do you think about that in terms of like what people are kind of being programmed into thinking and the kind of actions? you know, that they're programmed into doing, and do you think that that's problematic in any way, or is that something that doesn't really apply? I mean, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, what have we done post-PRISM and NSA? How many people encrypt their emails now? Like, ha, 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 like kind of no one, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so you, you put in the position of being the NSA guy or something like this, right, as though this then becomes reproduced in the off-game world, right, so that you've got this transformation of subjectivity, you know, supposedly occurring between the game space and the non-game space, right? I guess my point was that's a mistake to assume. And it seems like there's a, quite a lot of discourse out there saying that there's now this indistinction between the game world and the non-game world. But that example or question of who encrypts their email, right, kind of shows, I think, the limits of that assumption. I think there is also this a bit... Uh not only, but like, but maybe like a bit like, a bit up, like idea in the Balkans, or maybe also in like only in Serbia, but I think generally in the Balkans, not only, like the idea that like how, like that you want to like to understand who 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 is the power structure, uh, like what is this kind of power structure, what this power structure has on our lives, and because like especially in Balkans, people like as time pass. People start to like more and more. I mean, every side, I think, like in in conflict in the in the 90s, they all start to think about now. Aha! Uh -huh, so they are guilty. So they, like, is it like CIA? Is it whatever? Who are like different kind of you know like the the secret power? And then like they're removing the you know the their own their own responsibility. So it's not like that. It's them or them. But I think that people. Maybe this is like it came like the idea how you want to so can you somehow understand the power structures, but probably this is like in the beginning kind of the fail kind of uh, uh, idea, but sometimes it's good to know like with whom you are dealing with maybe. Yeah, otherwise it's, hard. it's too abstract and like then you just don't know what it hurts. You need to make some kind of diagnosis. You need, you need to start, you know with certain diagnosis, and like in the 10 years, it could be most professional probably, or yeah. some serious. No, I mean, I think like games like you've made there are fantastic. I mean, the early game I used to get inspired by, actually it wasn't a game, sorry, it was Josh On's They Rule, you know, probably 10 years old now. But I'd love to talk with this guy to see how he did his research this, for that. I, I mean, that like was an kind of extraordinary political economy that he sketched out there. Or a bit of the Tude, for example. Mm. It's, I mean, I think it's a fascinating uh, group of people that were, that were active and they did like perfect mapping and you can always say yeah but it's only mapping of the power structures like where is this the catch yeah but like I didn't know before their maps the connection of the Saudi royal family really with the uh, with the uh, exporters of uh, uh, like uh, serious weapons in the United States and then the connections like with the media I mean their maps showed us okay so what is this knowledge that's the question how you can use it yeah that's the question I'm sorry to say that I think that there are still open questions from this discussion, like uh, and it's question of the gap in between the real world and the game world, ethical questions, 
uh, or questions of design, but it's also a good thing that we still have open questions because this will keep you attending the <laughs> next sessions that we will have at Transmediale. I thank uh, the panel very much. Thanks, Ned. Thanks, Vladan and Christian, and also our interveners, Tobias, Anna, Elias, Daphne, and Jennifer. Thank you very much also to the audience. Thanks. Bye-bye.